And uh, now please uh, help me welcome with a big round of applause our director, Mr. Danny Menkin. All right. Um, wow, thank you so much, Doc NYC. Where it, it's really a pleasure for us to be here. This film is something that is really close and dear to my heart, you know. I mean, whoever was there will never forget. I was seven years old at the time. So it's especially important for me and, and exciting to show it here in the United States because many people don't know about it. And I have really the honor to have here executive producer Nancy Spielberg that I cannot say thank you enough for everything she does. And producer John Weinbach, you know, the incredible producer that helped this film so much to become what it became. And it, Tal Brody, the hero of the film. Uh, we have uh, Dana Lerner, a uh, producer from Channel 8. That's how the movie really started. And I will not be too long because all of these guys are welcome to come on stage and we will be doing Q&A after the film. So I hope you'll enjoy it. It combines really three things that I love, which are movies, sport, and Israel. So I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I enjoyed making it. Thank you so much. Thank you, and please stay for a wonderful Q&A. Hello, everybody. Thank you for staying. We have a director come over here. We have Mr. Danny Menke. We have superstar of Maccabi. We have, who do we have? OK, we have, uh, first and foremost, executive producer Nancy Spielberg, producer uh, John Weinbach, and we have uh, the one that put us on the map. Mr. Tal Brody. Tal Brody, you know. We're really honored to have also General Consul Danny Dayan. Thank you so much. And I would love to invite Chris Bortwright, which you've seen in the film. Please join us, Chris Bortwright. And Dana Lerner from uh, Channel 8 is here with us. And great people, Jeff Jones that did the graphics here. So uh, I would not go for all the list, but the wonderful people are here with us. So, yeah. So, um, this is such an incredibly well-crafted film. I mean, like, the way that you put together the archival footage, you know, the actual footage of your games, you know, the historical relevance of, like, everything that was happening that is still so relevant today, and, uh, and how you bring us back and forth, you know, from, like, you guys watching yourselves, like, 40 years before. It's just so exciting. Can you tell us a little bit of your journey? Please, come on, right, come sit down. Can you tell us a little bit about... Um, and I know this film is very personal for you, as you said in the beginning, and it works so well with your voiceover, you know, because you really bring us in, you know, from inside. Can you tell us a little bit about how did you conceive this project? You know, when did it happen that you said, I want to make this? And how did you achieve, you know, this wonderful um, collage of, of incredible emotion? Yeah, I mean, thank you so much. I mean, it, it really started when, um, actually, a few years ago, uh, Jim Botwright passed away. And I was speaking with the executive producer from Israel, from Channel 8, Renat Klein, who is the daughter of Ralph Klein. And we started to talk about how is it that there was not a movie about it. This is like for us, like the first man walking on the moon. You know, when Tal Brody says we're on the map. And 40 years, so many things have changed in Israel besides Tal Brody that hasn't changed. <laughs> exactly the same. Yeah, but, but besides that, so many things have changed. And we're starting to be concerned that, you know, if we're not going to tell this story now, you know, we will not be able to tell that to our children. And where, then we started to find so many amazing archives that have never been seen, and so many stories that have never been told. People did not remember even the fact that the prime minister is resigning exactly the day of the game. How dramatic was the story of Tal and his father. And slowly, slowly, it became kind of, I would say, the force gump of Israeli <laughs> basketball. Because everything, all the politics of Israel at that time, and you can even argue until, in some element until today, were in, in this film. And that's why I felt very lucky to have, you know, this really A team with me in order to tell the story. Because I, I realized there was not a story about it so far. And I thought there are probably not going to be another story about it. So we will be the team that will tell that story. And we're really extremely motivated and we're very excited to show it here first time in New York and to go out with it. 
Danny, Nancy, John, like, I mean, how, how was it putting together the production of this? Because you've really talked to everybody. I mean, not only that you bring us, you know, like in real time to the houses of the people that they were watching it, but then you have this incredible um, in group of people, like from political commentators, you know, to uh, diplomats, to activists that went into prison, you know, to, to sports personalities. How did you go out getting that to happen? Well, I think the uh, the most important ingredient was that absolutely everybody loves Tal Brody, and they jumped on it. Because, you know, people say to me, well, "How did you get Bill Walton for your film?" We went, "We didn't really have to try." Everybody loves Tal Brody. Every every Israeli that I speak to, you know, older men say I had posters of him all over my walls. So I think that was um, the motivating factor. Everybody believed in the story and believe and owe him so much, and that's why they jumped on. Plus, a lot of talent with Donnie, with John. John's very well connected as well, and that really helped move the, the film and all the interviews forward. John did the film, and he will talk about it, the, the, calls The Other Dream Team, and then when we joined forces, that was the time that you know, I realized everybody knows about the miracle on ice, but they don't know about our miracle on hardwood, which is, in our view, bigger than the miracle on ice, and we have to make a film about it. And when we approached Bill Walton and sent him this email, he just replied, everything for Tal Brody forever. <laughs> in capital. Yeah, and for John Weinbach. <laughs> uh, that's very kind, but I mean, it, it, it is, um, I've been lucky enough to work on some high profile sports documentaries for ESPN, for HBO, and uh, Danny was mentioning the film called The Other Dream Team. While I was making it, I, my dad's two sisters made Aliyah. And so we went to Israel and, and uh, I'd always, I'm a massive basketball fan, I grew up a Lakers fan, and I'd, I knew about Maccabi Tel Aviv, and my dad would say, you know, there's this guy, Tal Brody, it's a great story. And we, D Danny actually came to me about a different project, and he, we were talking, and he said, you know, I'm making this film for Israeli television about Maccabi Tel Aviv. I said, no, not the 77 story. And we sort of had this immediate bonding moment, and it sort of went from there. There was, there was a, a film that was in the process of being made for an Israeli audience, and I said, look, this is a great film, but it has the potential to be an, a really special project um, with some American interviews, with, with a point of view uh, that gives a little bit of the context because I think even Danny um, didn't realize, you know, for an Israeli audience, they, they've, there's an assumption that they know the history and the Yom Kippur War and, and, and Tebi. And I said, but you gotta put that in because it, it really provides a context um, that elevates it, you know, from just a sports story to a great story. And so needed also, like in these dire times. Um, Mr. Brody, um, how was it to see yourself all these years later, you know, and like with your team of mates, like sitting on the bench watching that, that you know, game as if you were there? Because it's so incredibly exciting to watch you. And how was it to like take part on this journey with them? Yes, first of all, uh, I thank our Consul General, uh, Danny Dayan. Uh, coming and representing us in the United States, and I know he's doing a great job and has a great job ahead of him to do. And thanks, Chris, for joining us here. It's really, we have great moments when we see these to relive together, and great to see your children and grandchildren are here. And thanks for friends and relatives and all of you that came out on a Sunday morning <laughs> after the election year and everything and all the excitement. And thank you all for coming. You know, for me, I have seen this, uh, the Hebrew version in Canada and Australia and about seven times within the United States. And I'm learning a lot about myself. And I'm, I'm saying, when I look about decisions you make in life, when finishing up the University of Illinois, 16,000, over 16,000 a game, the best conditions that any athlete can have in the Big Ten Conference, uh, being drafted uh, 12th or 13th in the draft, uh, depending on Wikipedia and their <laughs> Google. And if it was today, 12th or 13th, uh, you signed for about $2.7 million a year, two years no cut contract, the third year it opens up. And at that time, uh, Billy Cunningham, he's one of the 50 greatest, he was in Israel last month. So I said, Billy, just to remind me, because the guys every time in the NBA All-Star Weekends, it's in New Orleans this year, they always ask me the same questions about why did I go to Israel, why did I stay in Israel, and if today you were coming 
out of college and he got from the, that's the Washington Wizards the contract to sign, would you make that same decision? And I give him the same answer. You know, they're all, we're all over 70 today of the guys that I played with. And I said, look, I'm not crazy. Of course, I would take the $2.7 million, you know. <laughs> but if I had to take it and if I had to give up those beautiful 49, 50 years that I'm already in Israel, I would not take it. I would still take that road to Israel. I got eight grandchildren there. It's, uh, believe it or not, every time when I come into the United States, the first time we came in, there was a premiere in Chicago, everybody's saying to me, Tao, you're crazy, you're going to go to Chicago? Everybody's getting killed over there. <laughs> <laughs> Israel's the safest place in the world, believe me. <laughs> so anyway, as I said, I'm looking quickly at that movie, and I say, I made that decision from the University of Illinois not to take that offer to go into the Baltimore Bullets, $12,500 a year was the was the salaries at that time. It wasn't, it was my dream to play in the NBA. And I took that road to Israel for one year. It's already 50, but it was one year. And that decision to stay in Israel, when Maccabi Tel Aviv came to me and they said, look, Tal, and this is 1965 Maccabiah games. The country is going through a serious recession. You're a Jewish kid from Trenton, New Jersey. If you go to the NBA, you'll be one of there's a hundred and some players at that period of time. But if you would come to Israel, you can probably help take our team to another level. We never got past the first round. People aren't smiling. And that challenge to me at that period of time in life was more than any remuneration you could get from the NBA or any sense of maybe feeling. So that was my first decision. Then after my first year in Israel, it was, I, it was so great, not only the basketball, but the social life, the cultural life, the life within the families and friends. I decided to come back for a second year, and then after the second year, which was even greater than the first year, not only in basketball, outside of basketball, when I wanted to make Aliyah to Israel, that's when I got my draft notice from the United States Army. And I wanted to make Aliyah, but... Because it was a time of Vietnam, and because they start taking uh, d uh, drafting academics, I said, well, look, if I'm going to come to Israel and make Aliyah, I have my family in the United States, I got my education in the United States, I'm going to first do that two-year service, and then I'll come back to Israel after that. And making that decision at that period of time, when... You know what Vietnam was at that period of time and what a war it was. I look back at it when I see the movie and say, well, that is the met, uh, decision to make. And I never regretted it. And uh, as you see in the movie, I get excited every time that I see it to be a part of it. And we had a great group of guys. And in 77, it turned out to be not only what you saw in the movie, but we also won the European Film Festival. We already uh, we won the Miss Universe, Rena Moore, outside of everything around that, 76, 77, 78, and Tebby and everything. But I'm from Madrid, so you beat us big time. <laughs> from Real Madrid. Yes. Real Madrid so, is the best in Europe. <laughs> Chris, how was it for you to be part of this movie and to see it here today with all these people? Well, I didn't know that I'd have be on screen that much. <laughs> but I have to tell you that... Um, when Danny contacted me three years ago, I think, um, and told me um, that this film was going to be made, I was, it just brought up in me this, I have to go back to Israel. I have to be back there. So I worked some things. I was teaching school at the time, and I said, well, what if I were to come to Israel in October? And Danny said, that'd be great. We will, we'd love to have you interview. And... I took El Al because I knew that when we landed, we'd be singing Shalom Aleichem. <laughs> and they didn't. And oh. I was in tears <laughs> because that's all I remembered. I was so excited for that. But um, just had some time connecting with basketball friends and many friends that I had made, um, Jim and I had made in Israel inside of basketball and outside of basketball. And I, I wouldn't trade those years. I wouldn't trade 
three years ago for anything. <laughs> it's been wonderful. Let's open up for some questions. If I can see you, please raise your hands. Yes? Yes, right there. Thank you. Well, one, one bit of context is worth mentioning. I mean, what David Stern says is, is true. I mean, Tal's being very modest. Maccabi Tel Aviv, I don't think it's overstating things to say it's, if not the number one franchise, professional basketball franchise outside of the United States, it's in the top three. They've won now five? No, we're six, six times the European Championship. Over 16 times we've been in the final four of Europe. And we're the only team, six years ago, uh, I was invited to represent Maccabi Tel Aviv in Springfield, Massachusetts, in the James Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame, the only team and the first team outside of the United States that was granted an exhibition and honored in the James Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame, where you see the Los Angeles Lakers and the Boston Celtics and all the great teams. The first team that was invited to be honored was Maccabi Tel Aviv, an Israeli team. I'm getting the sign that this is all we have for now. I'm, I'm really, really happy to have you here. I'm going to have, um, I'm sure they can answer some questions in the lobby if you are like. Yeah, absolutely. We will be at yeah. the table over there. By the way, we have also.